right, thank you. Welcome to my talk, Rethinking Detection Engineering. False positives are bad, false negatives are worse. My name is Jared Atkinson, and I'm the Technical Director for Adversary Detection Services at Spectre Ops. Before we begin, I want you to consider a situation in which you are a Tier 1 SOC analyst. Your daily workload is predicated on triaging alerts generated from detections that are used to categorize events into two groups, malicious and benign. These alerts are obviously best effort, but some are better than others in terms of accuracy. Over time, you notice a pattern of a detection that commonly fires on events that are ultimately determined to be benign and rarely fires on events that are malicious. As a SOC analyst, your perception tells you that this is a problem because you find yourself wasting time triaging events that are not malicious, and this ultimately limits the time you can dedicate to real malicious activity. As such, you recommend that this particular detection be reevaluated to reduce the prominence of false positives. Does this sound like a familiar process? Is this a correct approach? Are there potential un unintended consequences? I personally think the answer is yes. And this talk attempts to explore that problem and attempts to reason through a potential solution. Please join me through this journey. Before we analyze the elements of detection engineering, I think it's important to discuss binary classification. This is important because binary classification is a key component of detection engineering decision making. It is defined as the task of classifying the elements of a set into two groups, positive or negative, on the basis of a classification rule. Now this is a fairly generic definition, but I want you to think about it from a detection engineering perspective. Consider the elements of a set to represent the events collected from your enterprise and the two groups, positive or negative, to equate to malicious and benign, respectively. Lastly, this classification decision is made by a classification rule, which we can think of as a detection rule or series of detections. So we're using a detection rule to determine if an event should be classified as malicious or benign. As we are thinking about this problem, it is important to remember that we are making these decisions with imperfect knowledge, as in we don't actually know the true state of the event but we are using our understanding of the situation to make the best decision possible. For this reason, we will refer to this decision as a prediction. This section will dive into many of the concepts of binary classification, which will help facilitate later discussions about some of the pitfalls that we might expect in our current detection engineering process. Before we start discussing the individual concepts within binary classification, I want to explain how I plan to present these ideas. Each concept will be accompanied by a graphic, I'm a visual learner, so the graphic is really helpful for me to grasp these concepts. Additionally, we will explore binary classification through two examples. The first example is something we are all probably too familiar with in 2020, disease testing. The second example is something more cybersecurity related, which is the detection of malicious service creation. The first concept we will discuss in binary classification is population, which is defined as a set of similar items or events, which is of interest for some question or experiment. I've represented the population as a circle on the right side of the slide. This can be seen as all the people who have been tested for the disease or as all telemetry collected for inter from enterprise assets respectively. Next, we can explore the idea of condition positive, which represents the real number of positive events in the collected data. Here we see a red circle, which represents the objective state of positive elements. In our example, this would be the objective subpopulation of sick people, or people that are positive for the disease, or the objective subpopulation of malicious events. If we overlay our classification rule onto the condition positive, we see that there are some cases where the rule cor correctly predicts the positive classification, and some cases where it incorrectly predicts the positive condition. This is representative of the two possible condition positive results, true positive and false negative. The second possible result is a false negative. This is defined as positive events that are classified as negative, or using our example, sick people incorrectly identified as healthy or malicious services incorrectly identified as benign. In the, in the graphic, I've identified false negatives as yellow. This is where our predicted negative events and condition positive events overlap. False negatives represent a large societal or organizational risk. Unfortunately, this failure is often silent as a second test is often not applied. Uh, we might see a sick person go about their life thinking they are healthy or a malicious service will remain undetected. Binary classification has a metric known as sensitivity, which measures the ability of the test to correctly detect events that meet the condition. It answers the question of how likely are you to identify sick people as being sick? 
In the picture, you see a yellow shape, which represents the true positives, and the red circle, which represents condition positive events. By comparing these values, we, we can derive the sensitivity of our test. The sensitivity of the test is often dictated by risk tolerance. What is the risk of accidentally telling a person who is actually sick with COVID-19 that they are healthy? If the risk of the situation is not acceptable, then it may be important to increase the sensitivity of our test. Like condition positive, condition negative represents the real number of negative events in your collected data. You can see that this is shown by the red donut shape in the graphic. If you analyze the shape, you might realize that the red portion of the graphic is the population minus the condition positive circle. If we apply the idea of condition negative to our examples, we can see that it represents the objective subpopulation of healthy people, people that are negative for the disease, or the objective subpopulation of benign events. If we overlay our classification rule, we see that we have two possible situations relative to condition negative events. These events can be referred to as true negatives and false positives. We'll explore these categories in the next slides. A true negative event is defined as the negative events that are classified as negative, or in terms of our examples, a healthy person correctly identified as healthy, or a benign service correctly identified as benign. These are the events that we can happily ignore since we are not alerting on them and they are not malicious by nature. If you've worked in a SOC or anywhere near a SOC, then this next concept is likely something you are intimately familiar with. False positives are negative events or non-malicious events that are classified as positive or malicious. This would be represented by healthy people that are incorrectly identified as sick or benign services that are incorrectly identified as malicious. As I'm sure many of you know, false positives can be extremely costly from an individual perspective because they fail noisily. A false positive alert typically must be triaged as if it is a true positive, and if too many false positives are alerted, it could cause major issues for the SOC. Specificity is a metric in binary classification that measures the ability of the test to correctly reject events that do not meet the condition. In other words, how likely are you to identify healthy people as being healthy? You'll notice that we again represent true negatives as a yellow shape and condition negative as a red shape. To understand specificity, we must overlay these values to understand how specific our test actually is. It is important to note that sensitivity and specificity are independent of each other, but in a situation with imperfect knowledge, it can be difficult to completely divorce these metrics. When creating a test, it is important to understand the desired level of sensitivity and specificity. The answer is typically related to risk tolerance. To give an example, I'm a huge soccer fan and my favorite team is Bayern Munich. Before each match, the players are tested for COVID-19 and recently one of the players named Serge Gnabry had a positive test result. Now the rules in Bavaria, a state in Germany, require him to quarantine for 14 days as a result of the positive test. During those 14 days, he took four more tests, all of which produced a negative result. The conclusion that was reached was that his first test had been a false positive. This false positive caused him to miss three or four matches, which from his perspective as a professional athlete is probably a pain. But when it comes to infectious disease, especially regarding someone who is traveling internationally and interacting closely with others, it is likely more important to properly detect everyone with a disease than it is to avoid false positives. Tests should generally consider whether the risk of a false negative, which generally represents macro or societal risk, outweighs the risk of a false positive, which generally represents micro or individual risk. We've now arrived at a situation that I alluded to in the introduction, the concept of false positive reduction. Remember that false positives are tangible or apparent while false negatives are invisible, which can lead analysts to conclude that the biggest problem they face is related to false positives. In my experience working and consulting with detection engineering and SOC monitoring, I've observed the tendency to view false positives as a net negative. In some cases, that's true, but in other cases, they can be the result of an increase in the sensitivity of the detection. As a result, the tendency is to tune detections, which in practice typically means reduce false positives. If you take anything away from this talk, I really want you to be aware of the specter of false negatives that are constantly looming over your detection engineering efforts. When you are tuning a detection, ask yourself, in my effort to reduce false positives or increase specificity, Am I accidentally introducing opportunities for false negatives to thrive? When you tune, think about how you can maintain sensitivity while increasing specificity. I want to draw your attention to the graphic. Notice that we have the population represented by the outer circle, the condition positive events represented by the red circle, and the classification rule where positive classification is represented by the green shape. 
Also notice that we have a fair amount of false positives, which are represented by any area within the green shape that does not overlap with the red circle. I often see efforts to reduce false positives that do something like this. We see that our tuning effort successfully reduced false positives or increased specificity, but at what cost? A quick analysis shows that our changes also increase the occurrence of false negatives, as in we decrease sensitivity. This is a problem that I worry about on a daily basis with our customers and is something that is often overlooked. Let's see if we can find a way to limit this type of unintended consequences going forward. Now that we have a collective understanding of binary classification, we can begin to explore what I think of as a common detection engineering routine. This example is of course not comprehensive, but kind of represents an aggregation of common practices I've observed in my work as a consultant. This example can be applied agnostically, but I will continue to use malicious service creation as, an, as a tangible example for those that benefit from it. In this section, we will explore how we can build a set of detections focused to this end and some of the common pitfalls that I've seen in current approaches. A key component of any detection and response program is collection. I view telemetry collection as a way to gain context about the events that are occurring in your enterprise. It will tell you things like user account X logged on to computer Y or a process called PowerShell.exe was created on computer A. As you might have noticed by the graphic on this, on this slide, the population that we are testing against is comprised of the telemetry that we collected from our environment. Unfortunately, we live in a world where resources are constrained, so we can't afford to review every individual event that arises. Instead, we must create detection rules, a test that helps us identify malicious events, in this case, our malicious service creation. The first detection approach is to build what I refer to as precise detections. These are detections that are very concerned with specificity, meaning they have a low false positive rate, but are also prone to false negatives. The great thing about precise detections is that they reduce the burden of detection, triage, and investigation, since they are typically derived from some IOC of known bad activity. For instance, known bad command lines, known bad hashes, known bad URLs, et cetera. And any alerts are typically true positives, but the overall increase to organizational security posture is minimal. For each concept, I will provide an example of a rule for detecting malicious service creation based on the concept of the slide. An example of a precise detection might be to look for services with a specific name. In this case, we're looking for mal SVC, uh, which was observed to be used by an attacker as part of a malicious attack campaign. It is unlikely for a legitimate service to use this name, so all alerts should be representative of malicious activity, but it is also trivial to avoid this detection for attackers. The opposite case of a precise detection is a broad detection focused on having high sensitivity, which leads to a low false negative rate, but also has a high false positive rate as a result. The great news here is that we are more likely to capture all malicious events but we're increasing the triage and investigation burden placed on the SOC. An example of a broad detection might be to detect all services that are set to auto start on system boot. Since services are often used for persistence, this may be a good way to detect that type of activity, but it is also likely to wrongly identify many legitimate services as well. The next concept I'd like to talk about is inference. We often deal in two types of inference, inductive and deductive. In inductive inference, we identify a feature that is shared among a set of malicious events and assume that feature is common among all malicious events. Deductive inference, on the other hand, is the process of reasoning from one or more logical statements referred to as premises to reach a conclusion. In this case, we've set our detection to alert on services that were created by a process on a remote machine, as this may be indicative of lateral movement. To arrive at this conclusion inductively, we might analyze a few samples of known malicious services and notice that they were all created remotely, which would lead us to assume that all malicious services are created remotely. If we reach this conclusion deductively, we might have considered something like the idea that services can be used for lateral movement and lateral movement is done via a remote means. So services used for lateral movement will be done remotely. It's worth noting that both approaches are somewhat flawed. Inductive inference is prone to confirmation bias and deductive inference relies on your understanding of the problem as a whole. Next, I'd like to talk about univariate detections. These are represented by individual detections that only consider a single variable as part of their logic. Until now, each detection that we've discussed is univariate. We've alerted on the service name, the service type, and whether the service was created remotely, but for each individual detection, we've only used one variable. The problem with this approach is that it is overly reductionist in nature 
and each new detection does not inherently increase coverage because there may be overlap. An example of a new univariate detection that we may add would be to alert on services where the service registry key was created by a process other than services.exe. This is strange because services.exe is the service control manager's RPC server, and all service creation that flowed through the provided Microsoft API would also flow through the server. Later on, we will discuss the idea of multivariate detections, which is where numerous variables are considered together to reach a more complex conclusion. This is something that I think we see in vendor threat scores related to malware, for example, but I think it can be applied to more specific situations like service creation. Lastly, as you may have noticed, we have been building a layered detection approach for identifying malicious service creation. To finish this approach, maybe we create a detection to alert on services that are executing unsigned binaries. This may indicate that the service is not part of an approved enterprise application and may be suspicious. At this point, we've completed our generic layered detection approach for identifying malicious service creation. In the next few slides, we will investigate why this may or may not be sufficient. In statistics, there's an idea called uncertainty, which basically says that we have limited or fallible knowledge, which makes it impossible for us to accurately describe the existing state, a future outcome, or more than one possible outcome. This means we can't possibly quantify the volume of false negatives that we are left with as a result of our detection efforts. Additionally, it is common for organizations not to have a safety net for reviewing events that are not subject to an alert, like predicted negative events, for example. We don't know where the condition positive is relative to our classification rule. Maybe we get lucky and it's a situation like this where the majority of condition positive events will be classified as positive by our detection. It is equally likely that we will have a situation like this where we are quite far away from the ideal state and a large portion of the condition positive events become false negatives. This is a situation that constantly bothers me. How can we account for this uncertainty? The rest of this talk is focused on sharing my current perspective of how I'd like to answer those questions and my current approach. While I was pondering how we might solve the inherent uncertainty that is found in detection work, I was introduced to a famous psychologist named Jean Piaget. Piaget is best known for his theory on childhood cognitive development, where he posited that we aren't born with the innate ability to deal with abstract thought. Instead, we must learn this ability through stages of development. Piaget identified four stages of cognitive development that children will experience from infancy to adulthood. The first stage, sensory motor, is commonly associated with newborns or infants. In this stage, the baby's worldview is limited to what they can sense directly. You may notice that babies put everything in their mouth because that is one of the ways in which they familiarize themselves with the world. In the pre-operational stage, children can begin to associate symbols with real things. For instance, a child at this stage may be able to draw a picture of their family in the form of stick figures. At this point, children begin to realize that they have accumulated knowledge, but they may not understand how that accumulation happened. If you've ever had a kid constantly ask you why, that is associated with them trying to understand where this knowledge came from. The third stage is the concrete operational stage, where children are able to think logically, but they are generally limited to what they can physically manipulate. Here we see that children are able to logically answer questions like, if Johnny ate twice as many candies as his sister, and together they ate nine pieces of candy, how many did his sister eat? This is especially true if the child is given physical objects to represent the candies. Lastly, we reach the formal operational stage where we can deal with abstract concepts and think logically in our own minds. For instance, instead of a word problem, we would answer the question 2x plus x equals 9. Can you solve for x? Piaget was also very interested in the idea of abstractions and how we should be careful about how we use abstractions with certain audiences. For instance, if you are the parent of a two-year-old and you ask them to clean their room, they likely won't complete the task in the manner that you desire. This is because clean your room is an abstract concept and they likely aren't ready to think that abstractly. Instead, it may be beneficial to adjust your instructions to suit their current level of cognitive development. They likely know what their teddy bear is and what a shelf is. So you may be better off by asking them to put their teddy bear on the shelf as this is a more concrete task that they can accomplish. In a similar vein, I think that we often think too abstractly in cybersecurity. Computers are an abstract concept by nature, but we often don't take the time to understand the technical implementation. Abstract tasks such as find evil or tuna detection may be too abstracted for us to take action in a meaningful and consistent way. Instead, it may be better to take a step back and analyze as an organization or as an entire community what these tasks actually mean.
As part of the formal operational stage, Piaget identified four reasoning skills, clarification, inference, evaluation, and application, which can help us understand abstract concepts. Clarification is used to identify and analyze the individual elements of the problem to decipher what information is required to truly understand the task. When asked to tune a detection, clarification helps to determine what specifically is being asked. Does tune mean remove false positives at all costs? Or does it mean increase the specificity while maintaining the sensitivity of a detection? Inference, on the other hand, can be used to understand what tuning a detection might look like. If we use deductive inference, we might reason that a tuned detection is both sensitive and specific. So we might work towards identifying ways to maintain sensitivity while increasing specificity. Alternatively, using inductive inference, we might look at three examples of tuned detections and one untuned detection. We can then draw conclusions based on the similarities between the tuned detections and the differences between the tuned and untuned detection to determine the characteristics of what a tuned detection actually are. Evaluation allows you to create success criteria and work towards task completion, assuming you have identified the correct criteria. Lastly, application involves applying your solution to improve the current state of detection within your enterprise. So we'll not, now we'll talk about the solution that I'm going to propose um, and maybe even show an example of how that might work. Um, as I was researching this talk, actually, Dr. Anton Shuvakin uh, released a paper or a blog post called On Threat Detection Uncertainty. And this is really interesting because this is like the main premise of what this talk is about, right? So the idea that uh, there is uncertainty in whether our detections are actually doing what we hope they do or achieving that goal or whether they're sufficient in nature. And so, and so he actually proposed kind of like three different approaches, right, to, to handle that uncertainty. So uh, the first approach is to improve alert triage, right? So the, the general idea is, is make yourself more efficient in triage so that you can make decisions about more events. And so this would be this, this approach, if we were using the terms that we've established thus far, is increase the sensitivity of our detections because we're more efficient at triaging false positives. And so we're able to handle more false positives as a result. The second approach, which is probably the main premise that I'm building my, my approach off of is this idea of use multi-stage detections, right? So the first stage would be maybe more sensitive uh, because you wanna have a more noisy signal to avoid uh, false negatives kind of at that first step. And then maybe have some sort of automation or additional scoring to be able to identify or prioritize those noisy signals. And then the last one is split bad from interesting. So we talked about precise and brittle signals uh, or detections. And so maybe there's a there's value in differentiating precise or like uh, detections that are going to result in known bad um, versus things that are interesting or just like, hey, this is anomalous or this is something that we want to look into. So there may be value there as well. I think in reality, you probably want to improve on all these things. So uh, maybe have a different workflow for bad uh, events versus interesting events. Maybe have some multi-staged approach that says, hey, we want to be overly sensitive at first and then maybe narrow in or establish some sort of score going forward. And then lastly, we want to like improve the efficiency of our, our alert triage so that we can triage more of those events uh, that we're receiving. And so as I was thinking about this, I kind of came up with uh, the six step process, right? And so the six step process is identify the base condition. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. Capture base instances identify contextual factors, add necessary context, evaluate a multivariate detection. I told you we'd come back to that and then uh, basically tune or fee provide feedback, right? So the first step in our process is to identify the base condition. And this is where we determine the condition that must be fulfilled by all positive events. For instance, is it possible to identify something that every malicious service must have in common? Ultimately, this will allow us to filter the population, so relative to all collective events, but also minimizes the likelihood of false negatives at this point, right? So uh, basically, if, if we capture all services, then, then we should be good to have no false negatives conceptually. In order to identify the base condition for our detection, which is focused on identifying the creation of malicious services, it is important to understand the high-level subpopulations of telemetry that we are dealing with. At this point, we have identified two groupings, the overall population, which represents all telemetry gathered from the enterprise, 
and condition positive, which represents all malicious services or our detection target. The overall population is represented by the white outer circle and the condition positive is represented by the small red circle. When it comes to identifying the base condition, I think it is important to narrow our focus from the overall population to a subpopulation that is simultaneously small relative to the overall population, but big enough to conceptually contain the entire condition positive subpopulation. In this case, the subpopulation can be represented by all service creation. The idea being that all malicious services must be services. So if we can identify a subpopulation that represents all service creation, then it must also include malicious services. So what do we do with this all service subpopulation? We can use it as a first stage of our multi-stage detection strategy. In the context of detecting malicious service creation, we can first reduce the problem set to only focus on events that could be indicative of malicious service creation. We are thus breaking the problem into two parts, identifying service creation and differentiating between benign and malicious service creation. Identifying service creation is a relatively easy step, while differentiating intent is often much more difficult and full of uncertainty. I think it is valuable to demonstrate this idea visually. The current trend is to focus efforts on detecting malicious services like this. But I'd recommend opening up the focus like this to reduce the likelihood of false negatives in the initial detection stage. Once we have successfully identified the base condition, we can focus on identifying an event which represents its occurrence. It's great that we conceptually know that for every malicious service, there must be a service creation event. But at some point, we need to actually convert this theory into, into the practical world, which includes leveraging our telemetry. So let's take a moment to explore how we might go about identifying instances of the base condition being met. Remember that capturing these instances should provide a high level of sensitivity or reduce false negatives, but will likely be low in specificity, which means increased false positives. When considering how to identify service creation, it is important to think about how services are represented on the system and where our monitoring opportunities are. In researching services, one might have come across an MSDN page that described the database of installed services in the registry. Apparently, when a service is created, it is added to a database which is stored at HKLM system current control set services. And as far as I'm aware, this is a requirement. So maybe monitoring for registry key creation events in this location would be a good starting point for identifying instances meeting the base condition. Alternatively, listeners familiar with the Windows event log will know about event ID 4697, which identifies service creation. Now we have two base events to choose from, so we need to think about the pros and cons of each. In thinking about this problem, I've identified two concepts that are valuable in making this distinction. The first is the initial contextual details provided by the event. The event log provides the service name, file name to be executed, service type, and startup type, while Sysmon's registry key creation event only provides the name of the process that created the key and the name of the service via the registry key name. In this case, it seems that the event log is superior. However, we must also investigate how the event is generated in the first place. The event log is generated via the SCM RPC server in services.exe. If you're interested in learning more about this, we will cover this concept in our capability abstraction workshop later today. This means that the event is only generated as a result of service creation via the approved creation mechanism or API. Alternatively, the registry key creation will fire in the case that the API is used, but will also work in other instances, like if an attacker creates a service by editing the registry directly. For this reason, I decided to use the registry key creation event as my base event. Let's dig into this registry key event. You may notice that the contextual details included in this event are fairly sparse. While this event doesn't tell us explicitly about service creation, we can use our knowledge from Microsoft documentation to understand that it is implicitly describing this activity based on the registry key itself. One thing I think is important is to differentiate between fields reported in the event that are explicitly valuable to our use case and those that are not. In doing this, I create what I refer to as a composite event. This is an event that is built from numerous sources to describe the scenario I am interested in. As mentioned in the consideration slide, our composite event, which is based on the registry key creation event, is fairly limited. Currently, we are only aware of the process that created the event, services.exe, and the name of the service itself, which is TYLIU, so on and so forth. 
While the name of the service may look suspicious, it is very difficult or almost impossible to make a decision on the nature of the service given the current known context. Since our current understanding of the event, which is represented by the composite event, is so limited, it is important to add additional contextual factors to help us make a decision. This is represented by a list of all of the other details you would like to know about the service. In making this list, you may be able to identify a few different details that you know about, but you also want to learn about other factors which might be important. Let's look at how we might do this. Again, we might reference Microsoft documentation and stumble upon this page, which describes how to configure a service. While reading this page, we see that Microsoft provides an API function called change service config A that allows us to set this configuration. While attackers don't necessarily have to use this API, it is a good starting point to understand how it is intended to work and what options might be present. Upon investigating the function, we see that it allows you to specify a service via handle and then provide a number of different configuration settings. Among those settings are the service type, is this a standalone service or something involved with SVC host, the start type, will this service run on boot or require a manual start, the error control, what happens when an error occurs, the binary path name, what binary and arguments will be executed when the service starts, the load order group, tag ID, dependencies, service start name, password, and display name. We now have an initial list of contextual details that we might want to collect. Now analysts must find a way to gather that additional context and include it as part of our composite event. What we found through dynamic testing was that these details were stored as registry values under the main service registry key. While not every detail is required, we can enumerate the registry values for each service key through registry value monitoring and capture this context. Let's first look at adding the start and image path values. Notice that the start type is a numerical value that we would want to look up to understand its meaning, and the image path in this case is PowerShell.exe with an encoded command. It's worth noting that for visual purposes, I concatenated the command line, but an encoded command was originally included. We can then add these values to our composite event as we see in this slide. Now it's time to enumerate the remaining values and we find delete flag, which we didn't know about originally, object name, type, error control, and display name respectively. The other configuration options appear to not have been used. We can now build our final version of the composite event to represent this service creation event. There are definitely other opportunities to add context, such as whether the event was created remotely and what process initially requested the service to be created. For reference, services.exe created the registry key, but is an RPC server, so it is likely that some other process like sc.exe made the initial request. At this point, we haven't evaluated whether we believe this event represents a benign or malicious action. We have simply identified that it is a service and thus could be representative of a malicious service, and as such, we should build out as much context as we can about it. Now we can start to identify ways to determine if this service is in fact malicious. Ideally, we can do this as part of a multivariate detection, which considers many factors, which we've collected as part of our composite event. I don't wanna go into too much detail on how we can evaluate which threat factors are most important since Josh Prager is discussing that immediately after this talk. But generally, we'd want to use some combination of the details we've collected as part of our composite event to create some score that can represent our confidence in the likelihood that the service was indeed created for malicious purposes. As we've discussed, a consistent problem that we face is related to the inherent uncertainty in threat detection. How do we minimize that uncertainty? In April, John Hinsinski from Expel.io wrote a Twitter thread for how they handle uncertainty in their operations. He discussed the idea of quality assurance and quality control and how they operationalize those concepts for cybersecurity monitoring. For those that are unfamiliar with these terms, Quality assurance is focused on creating a process that prevents defects or errors from happening in the first place. This might be accomplished by creating a detection process that uses multiple stages and multiple variables to evaluate the likelihood that an event represents malicious behavior. Alternatively, quality control focuses on how one might identify defects or errors that occurred despite your best quality assurance efforts. Because uncertainty is a real phenomenon, we have to assume that our quality assurance efforts will fail and that we will miss a malicious service despite our best efforts at classification. So what John found is that in manufacturing, they account for this by investigating a sample set of events that were otherwise classified as benign. We've talked about our approach to quality assurance. Identify the base condition to limit false negatives at your starting point. Identify factors that can be used to differentiate benign and malicious instances of the base condition, 
generate some sort of multivariate classification which might result in some score or rating. But we also need to consider quality control. Just because an event has a low score does not mean that it's 100% benign. It may simply represent a flaw in our understanding of the problem. To account for this, it is important to establish procedures for triaging and investigating events with different scores. Given a set of events that meet the base condition, we may identify a group of high threat events. These events will represent events that are extremely likely to be malicious given our understanding of the problem. Generally, this group should have a low false positive rate, but will make a sacrifice by allowing some false negatives to exist. We should triage all or at least the majority of the events in this category. Next, we have medium threat events, which is a bit less specific, but more sensitive. We probably don't want to investigate every alert generated at this level, as there will be more false positives, but we should investigate a good portion of them as this covers the majority of the remaining false negatives. Lastly, we have low threat events, which include the remaining events in our base set. I think it is important to determine a sufficient sample set within this group to help inform future scoring efforts. For all we know, an analyst may discover a malicious service through manual analysis that our scoring system didn't account for. The last step is to use the output of our investigations to tune our scoring going forward. Did we determine that there were too many false positives in the high threat category? If so, what commonalities did these false positives exhibit and how can we remove those without sacrificing the sensitivity that we currently have? Did we discover a malicious event within the low threat category? Can we leverage what we learned about this to make our medium or high threat category more sensitive without losing specificity? This is the end of my theoretical discussion on dealing with the inherent uncertainties involved in binary classification and specifically in threat detection. You may be thinking that this approach will be difficult to implement within your environment. I agree that it might be a paradigm shift, but it is worth considering whether the shift would be worthwhile. One of my colleagues, Jonathan Johnson, took some time to build a POC using Jupyter Notebooks and Splunk to show what this approach might look like in practice. I'll now hand it over to Johnny to demo his solution. Take it away, Johnny. Within this notebook, the first thing we're going to do is connect to our Splunk instance. In order to do that, I'm going to utilize the Splunk SDK to connect to the Splunk REST API to pull back data. So the first two columns, you can see that I am going to be installing packages, importing those packages, and then connecting to my Splunk instance. Now for this detection, our use case is going to be service creation. And one thing to note, as you will see amongst these different notebooks, is that documentation needs to lie around the code blocks that we have implemented. The reason for this is to give contextual information to the detection engineer or the CERT team member to let them know what we are trying to accomplish inside of each notebook. Otherwise, it would be super hard for them to understand what we are trying to accomplish or update these notebooks in the future. So for our use case service creation, we want to identify what our base condition is. And in order to do that, we have to identify the one thing that an attacker or anyone really needs to accomplish to complete this task. That is to create a sub key under the services key inside of the registry. To find that data, we can utilize Sysmon event ID 12, as you can see here in my query, which looks for registry key creates and registry key deletes. Now, Jared came up with this nice regex, which will basically look for anything created under the services key, but then has an end anchor to stop at right after the first key in the services, meaning that it won't look for any other keys created after that. For example, it will not pick up services slash TCP IP slash parameters but it would, cre it would um, pick up on something, say, if there was a service created called SOCON, it would pick up services forward slash SOCON. Then I wanna document what my base context is. So this is the information I'm hoping to get back from this query so I can utilize that inside of the next notebook. Here you will see I'm doing basic transformation to pull the Splunk data and then transform it in a way that is easily manipulatable inside of data frames. Then I'm going to be utilizing Panda SQL to look specifically for create keys since we're looking for service creation. Then that's going to correlate specifically with key creates. 
after that, I'm going to store that data frame and I'm just going to print it out just to show everyone um, what we have picked up. And here we can see we have seven events. Um, and in here, we do have the test that I ran, which was SOCON. And then here is a visual representation of the data that we pulled back. So since this notebook came back with more than zero events, the triage notebook would fire. Now, keep in mind this triage notebook, the point of that is to add contextual value to each data set to create a composite event. Again, we're going to connect to Splunk, and then we're going to document what the goal is and what type of data we are trying to pull back with these queries that we are going to implement. But before we can pull back any data, we have to collect that data. So I'm going to be pulling registry set values, network events, RPC host data for client and server side, Zeek data, and process creation events. After that, I'm going to move through and do joins. And these joins are going to take data from the base condition and join them on some of the data frames and data sets that we collected up above. Now, as you can see, one thing that we don't want is whenever a join is done, it automatically funnels and filters our events. That can be a problem because now we're only looking at one event versus all seven that we had. Well, I solved that problem here as you will see below. Again, more joins are being done and adding contextual information, right, to create a composite event. And as you can see, instead of before over here where we had only UTC time, process GUID, process ID, image, and target object. After all the joins have been completed, we now have a lot more information. So we have the parent image of the application name that kicked off the service creation, along with the network image that accepted that um, communication. We have the target object that was created. We have where it came from on the host, where it went to on the host, Zeek information and the command line that was there as well. Now, in order to add, we have to add this back into our base condition data frame because the reality is we want to send all of this data to the investigator. We want to send not just, just one event, but all seven events. And this is going to be, they're going to dig through these events by categorization and prioritization, which comes from a severity score, which I'll show here in a moment. I used list and then I appended these the information that I had from the joins to the lists, um, did a for loop to basically give the list the same length as the base condition data frame. Once that was done, I updated the data frame. Again, I have a severity. I'm not gonna get too deep inside of the severity as Joshua Prager will talk about this inside of his talk. However, this basically looks for if A and B are in this composite event, then give it this score or this score or this score. And those scores are low, medium and high at this time. As you can see here, the base condition has been updated with all of its information needed to create one big data set or one big data frame that has multiple composite events inside of it that surround each specific event. Once that's done, I'm going to store that data frame and I'm going to email these events as an alert to the cert team. And this is going to be my code block for that. Now, once that is done, the email will look similar to something like this. We'll have the severity, the service time, the host that the service was created on and all those contextual data pieces that the investigator will need to know. And from that composite event and it'll also hold the link to the notebooks by which they can go and look into these. Now the investigation notebook should be where the cert team member comes to look through all of these events. Again, it'll have investigation notes to kind of walk them through step-by-step step of how they go to deem these events as either malicious or benign. Um, it will pull back multiple data frames and other queries that were stored so they can look at these um, data sets from different perspectives. As you can see here, I have the investigation notes. I'm pulling back the base condition. So they have everything that they need to know from the, as one big data set, they can see all of these composite events. 
but then I'm also going to pull the singular um, joins that I did so I can see all those. And I'm going to give them a graphical representation because the key to looking at data is to look at it from different perspectives so you can understand what is happening with that data. So at, for example, here I'm looking at the registry join. If that event came back with more than zero, then it's going to give us a bar chart of the target object and so on and so forth. And then we get into our advanced queries, which involve like the Zeek, RPC, parent process data, all of that type of stuff. Here's a mapping for the Zeek endpoints. Here's a nice pie chart for all the Zeek operations, etc. And if any of these events have been deemed malicious, at the very end, there is a remediation process or notes. Now keep in mind the remediation process is completely manual. So it's going to be different per scenario. Now the question might be is how did I get these notebooks to run in a chain collectively in an automated fashion? Well, how I did that, that was through this Python um, script right here, which can be set on a loop timer. And basically what it does is it runs the detection notebook and if a specific data frame came back with more than zero events, then it would kick off the triage. And if the triage notebook had a specific data frame that came back with more than zero events, it would kick off the investigation notebook. That way, by the time the investigator got the email, all they would have to do is go to the investigation notebook and start to dig through all the data. I hope you all enjoyed this demo and walkthrough of this practical representation of Jared's concept. Um, at this time, the notebooks are not public, but they will be after a short while. So stay tuned for that. Back to you, Jared. All right. Thank you, Johnny. I appreciate that explanation. And with that, that concludes the talk, Rethinking Detection Engineering, False Positives Are Bad, False Negatives Are Worse. Again, my name is Jared Atkinson, and I'm the Technical Director for our Adversary Detection Services here at SpectreOps. I will stick around for a few minutes to take questions. Um, otherwise, I'll be available on Twitter or you know anywhere to, to answer any questions that anybody may have. And I would love to explore this topic more deeply with any of you. I look forward to hearing from you and uh, hope you have a good rest of your day. Mm -hmm.